Good morning, good morning, and welcome to Hardin Baptist Church this first Sunday of March. It's, I, it's, I, I can't even, it's hard to fathom the fact that we're in March already, but, you know, that's what time does. It just flies by, doesn't it? But uh, I just can say I'm thankful to be here this morning. I'm sure you're all thankful to be here, happy and healthy, and uh, hope you've come ready to praise the Lord and hear God's Word and uh, be blessed this morning. And uh, I don't know if any of you got out yet outside yesterday, but I know I was running around all kinds of places doing everything, and I saw some sun and sunlight everywhere. I saw Brother Eugene working on the, the yard up front here, and so... If you didn't get out in the sunlight yesterday, you missed a you missed a beautiful day. Um, but we know that uh, rain, shine, sunshine, snow, whatever, we can come together and praise the Lord together. So if you would stand with me as we sing the first and last stanza of Heavenly Sunlight. Good morning. morning. Sun's always shining above the clouds anyway, isn't it? That's where we dwell. All right. Let's have a word of prayer, shall we? Almighty God, we want to say thank you for the light of the world, which is Jesus Christ dwelling within our hearts, Lord, lighting our way. And thank you, Lord, for the enlightenment that you've given us uh, down through the years to see our need of a Savior and to come to Christ and to follow you, Lord, and to learn about you and love you and see our our very souls and hearts and lives transformed by the presence and power of the Lord our God. Thank you so much, Lord, that we're not the people that we used to be before we met Jesus. We ask your blessings on our time together this morning, dear Father, that you'd be honored and glorified. And Lord, we just pray that you come to church with us this morning here at Hardin Baptist Church, that we might know your presence, your power, and your blessings, Lord, and just to be able to express to you how much we love you and how grateful and appreciative we are for you, dear Lord. We uh, again ask your blessings upon those dear souls that are on our hearts, Lord, and ask you to have your blessed will and all that's said and done here today for your honor and your glory. We love you, we thank you, and we praise you in Jesus' holy and almighty name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Smile and say hi to your neighbor and have a seat. All right, there's three things I need to tell you right quick this morning. Number one, once the services have started, all the doors will, will be locked from the outside. So the, after service starts, if you have to go out to your car or something, you'll all have to go around to the front for you here to get back in, okay? Everybody get out there, you know, you, you can always get out, but you can't just walk back in unless you come around this front door. Sound good? All right, 
The second thing I want you to know is be in special prayer for Brother Rodney. He, uh, he had a bad time in Sunday school this morning and Miss Doris had to leave with him. So you pray for Rodney, okay? Uh, you know his situation and, and the prayers that he needs. Keep him in your prayer. The other thing is that uh, March is our emphasis for um, Annie Armstrong offering and prayer. We got a, a week of prayer for Annie Armstrong missions. Uh, this is uh, the spreading of the gospel in North America. You know, we had uh, Lottie Moon for Christmas. That's world missions. Well, Annie Armstrong is for our North American missions, okay? So pray for all that's going on in America, United States and Canada, and around here in North America. We got a lot of people, a lot of ministries, a lot of need. And so also uh, this month we'll be taking up uh, the special offering. Now they're in our monthly budget. We like to support missions all year round, but this is, you know, the special emphasis for this month gets them over the hump and gives them uh, operating money. So you give us the Lord leads, be as generous as you can, and especially pray for these people. It is a tough, it's a tough thing to do to go to, yeah, out here in America, right? America, we don't much care to hear about the gospel and Jesus and all that stuff much anymore. So we really need to pray for our missionaries, okay? And we'll be having a video to uh, introduce you to that uh, each week. So here's our video for today. When I tell people I'm a missionary, I get all kinds of questions. People ask, what kind of missionary are you? Or they want to know exactly what it is a missionary does. Or a lot of times you'll hear people say, a missionary here? You mean that's a thing? Well, there's 281 million lost people in the U.S. and Canada. So yeah, it's a thing. But there's one question no one ever asked me, and I wish they would. No one ever asked it, where is the finish line? That's the question I want to hear. What does mission accomplish look like? You can watch videos about North American missionaries like me. You can read stories about us, you can pray for us. But don't get so caught up in the methods and minutia of what we do that you miss the main thing. Everything you see and hear and read about us is really just a means to an end. We start churches to make Jesus known. We meet needs to make Jesus known. We move to unfamiliar places, we meet unreached people, and we attempt unrealistic things just to make Jesus known. There is nothing more important than that. Nada. Nothing at all. Jesus said, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. And so that's what our finish line looks like. It looks like obedience, same as your finish line. <laughs> God speak, you give, we go. Everything starts with your gift. So the Annie Armstrong is the offering. Those gifts enable us to go places where the gospel has never been. This is where we cross our finish line. This is where together we make Jesus known. Amen. There are a lot of people in our country, right? A lot of people, a lot of uh, ethnic groups, a lot of nationalities, a lot of cultures, and just a lot of people that don't know about Jesus. So we're happy to share the gospel with, uh, with our country. Amen? Amen? All right. Now, these guys were missionaries with a capital M. You know what? You're a missionary with a little M because we all have the same job as to share uh, the love of Jesus and the knowledge of Christ everywhere that we go. Amen? There you go. All right. And Brother Ernie is going to come help us sing, and you're going to sing really loud, right? We got, this morning we have like sections of people missing. All right. Now, we know where a bunch of them are. They'll be back. Don't worry about them, okay? Pray for them because some of them got problems and issues going on. But uh, you're going to have to sing loud enough to make up for all the empty pews, okay? All right. So, come on, Brother Ernie, help us sing, and we'll help you, brother. All right. Well, as... You probably just saw in that video, um, Jesus is what matters. And, you know, I think you'll, you'll hear it throughout the rest of our worship this morning that that's what we're singing about. We're singing about Jesus. And that's what we're here for. We're here to learn more about him and here to spread his love and his salvation to those who don't know it. So if you, if you, if you could, just take a chance in your life. Just pray that God use you to sp spread his name to somebody else. And you never know when it'll pop up. You'll never know when it'll hit your mind. But 
the worst they can tell you is no, I don't want to hear about it, but the best thing you can do is help, save, help somebody get saved. So we'll continue our worship with My Jesus, I Love Thee. Next, we'll sing together the first, third, and last stanza of 576, Take the Name of Jesus with You.
Last but not least, we'll sing all four stanzas of Blessed Be the Name, and I ask that we stand on the last verse. with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, Lord. Um, Lord, not, I just can't thank you enough for all the blessings in life and how, majest, how majestic your name is. And um, Lord, be with us um, as with this special coming up, Lord. Uh, be with Brother John and his message, Lord. And be with us all as we leave this place that we uh, shine a bright example of you, Lord, and lead others to your love, Lord. 
Lord, lead God, direct me, and forgive me of my sins. In Jesus' name, amen. So, you guys may not see it in the bulletin, but uh, Brother Bob and I have been talking about possibly doing something together, and we've kind of thrown ideas back and forth and uh, picked a few different things, and uh, we decided to go with a good old special from the hymnal and uh, something new for both of us. We never really kind of do edit, so we're going to take a hymn and split it today. We're going to do His Name is Wonderful. Thank you for that, guys and gals. Good morning again. Good to see you. Yeah. Yeah, I see you for a minute, and then I go sit down over here, and then I get back up here, and I turn around, and I'm thinking, I hope they're still there when I get back up here. <laughs> and here you are, right? <laughs> All right. It's good to see you this morning. This is the month of March, and uh, has fifth, five Sundays, and the fifth Sunday is uh, Easter. Easter is in this month. So what we're going to do on our Sundays in March is we're going to focus in on, the, uh, on, the, on that last week of Jesus, that Passion Week, and, and a lot of the things that went on during that week, okay? So uh, there's nothing more important than us to know about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's where the gospel is. And there are a lot of things that happened during that last week in the Bible, and we'll, we don't have time to talk about, well, I mean, we don't have eternity long enough to talk about everything that went on. But we're going to look at particular uh, pieces of that week and put it together. And I hope that you get a, not only a better understanding of what went on during that week, but also that you might be touched and moved and uh, draw closer to Jesus and have a deeper appreciation for him. So this morning we're going to talk about the King of Lambs. Let's stand with, with for the reading of the Word of God. And we have two texts this morning. One comes out of the book of Exodus. This is the, uh, the institution of the of Passover. And then our other will be the, uh, the triumphal entry, okay, on Palm Sunday. First of all, over in Exodus, in the days of Moses, here's what the Bible says. 
God said to Moses, speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, on the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. Now you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel will kill it at twilight, and, then, uh, and they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. And then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Fast forward 1,400 years. Here in the book of Matthew, it says, uh, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus had commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut, out, cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we want to say thank you for the magnificent story of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for the, uh, the myriad ways and times and, and, uh, and scriptures and, and uh, examples of all that you do to express your great love for us and the glory and beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we pray this morning that you'll help us to get a fresh and deeper look at what Jesus was going through during that week, Lord. We want to tell you again that we love you, that we thank you and we praise you, and I pray now that you would fill me with your spirit to bring a message for you, your honor, and your glory. For you and you alone are worthy, Lord. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and you are the Lamb of God. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' magnificent and infinite and almighty name we pray. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The death angel was going to prowl the streets of, Israel, uh, of Egypt. Uh, nine plagues had already happened. Moses and Pharaoh had not gotten along at all. And God was fed up with it. And he said, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to send my death angel. And this will be uh, for, for, the, for the Jewish calendar. This is going to happen on the, uh, on the 14th of the first month in their calendar. And God said, I'm going to send the death angel. And you're going to take this blood of the lamb and you're going to put it on the doorpost and over the lintel. And when I see the blood, I will do what? When I see the blood, I will pass over that household. And so God told Moses, he said, I want you to tell, uh, tell the whole nation of Israel, they're slaves today. They're going to be free tomorrow. And I want you to tell all of them, to all, to, to, for every household, to find them a lamb, and uh, you do that on the 10th, and you keep that lamb with you for these four days, and you get to know it, you get attached to it, yeah, and then and when, on, the, on the 14th at twilight, when the 14th begins, you know, the Jewish calendar, the day starts at sundown, okay, from sundown to sundown, they're 24 hours, and at that moment, sundown all of Israel will, will kill your lambs and then you'll clean it up and you'll roast it and you'll fix a meal of, of bitter herbs and unleavened bread and the roasted lamb and you're going to have your staff in your hand you're going to have your clothes on your sandals on your feet because you're ready to go and when I see the blood I will pass over you and the death angel if it does not see the blood will enter that household and the firstborn of every family will die Amen? This is the first Passover. God's saying you need two things. Number one, you need a sacrifice for your sin. Right? You got all this, all this red in your ledger. You got all this negative. All this sin against God. You need a solution for all the negatives. You need a, a sacrifice. You need to, an, an atonement. You need blood to be shed. But you also need... You also need freedom f for you and your people and your country and in your heart. You've been slaves in Egypt under the iron fist of Pharaoh your whole life. 
And so it's one thing to get your sins forgiven, but we're also, God says, we're going to give you a new king, a new kingdom, a new nation. You're going to become the nation of Israel again and, and leave this place. And you're going to get out of Egypt and cross the Red Sea and, and, and all that comes on after that. So you need forgiveness of sin and you need to be ushered into a new kingdom with a new king. And God said, Moses, you, you write this down. You have to do it every year. So every year on Nisan the 10th in the spring, early spring, it's Passover time. And they would get a lamb and they would keep it for four days. And on the 14th at twilight, they would, they would slaughter it and cook it and, and eat it. And with bitter herbs and with bread, uh, unleavened bread, they would talk about what it meant and the significance of it and the great deliverance that God gave to Israel based on the blood of the lamb and leave and walking out with a high hand the next day. And this has gone on, this went on for years and years and years. It still goes on today. This is an ocean of blood. Millions of Hebrews for 1400 years up till the time of Christ. There had been shed an ocean of blood of countless, endless lambs. But we sing an old song. It goes like this. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Right? And therein is your problem because it doesn't matter how many lambs you slaughter. Or bulls or goats or sparrows or doves or all the other ocean of blood that was shed down through these centuries. It is, the Bible said it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to forgive us of our sins. However, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. God said the life of the flesh is in the blood. So that's going to be your sacrifice. So even in the, in the ocean of blood for all these centuries, there was never enough there to forgive you of your sins and to set you free and to deliver you into a new kingdom all on its own. After 1,400 years, there's uh, Jerusalem, and uh, uh, there's Jesus out there with the disciples, and he's been to, he's been to Bethany to see his uh, friend Lazarus, Mary and Martha. You know, he's been raised Lazarus from the dead. They're getting along pretty good. And it is a, high, it is a holy day in Israel. It's, it's the Passover week. And it is required of Jewish men, if they're able, to make three annual pilgrimages to actually go to Jerusalem, present yourself at the temple before God Almighty, bring an offering or whatever, and many other, many other things that go along with that. Passover is one of those times where every Jewish man is required, if, if possible, to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Well, everybody's going to go to Jerusalem on Passover. I mean, it's, it's a happy day. It's a big day. It's a, oh, you'll see the kinfolks that you haven't seen for years. You know, well, since last year. And everybody got time off and, you, and it's just a massive party. And so the town of, Is, or the, the town of Jerusalem was, you know, was full of people then. But, but on Passover, they'll just, be, they'll just be millions. Jews from all over the place. Even Jews from a foreign country, from, from Egypt and from Babylon, would make a pilgrimage. Because everybody, be, everybody wants to be in Israel and Jerusalem at Passover time. You know, for us it's like Christmas. Where are you going to be at Christmas? Well, we'll travel across the country to be with family and friends and enjoy our Christmas, right? Well, it's like Christmas to them. It's that kind of a holiday. And it was, it was fun. It was full of feasting and dancing. And there's a special programs down at the temple uh, in the evening, some of those priests did fire torch. Dance. It was just a phenomenal thing. Everybody wants to be there. But, on the, but, but the Bible says that on the 10th of each month, uh, of the 10th day of that month, that still every man who represents a household is required to go get a lamb. So in Jerusalem, this time, they had gathered up lambs. By the hundreds of thousands. They have to be, they have to be certified. You can't just offer some whatever you got, right? They have to be certified. These have to be special lambs. They have to be a, a year or less uh, old. They have to be males. They have to be without spot, without blemish. The, the, uh, the inspector um, 
uh, scholars and, and uh, priests who examined these lambs had a list of requirements that a lamb must meet in order to be fit to be offered as sacrifice to Jehovah God at the temple. It had to not have a spot, no blemish. It can't have a cut on it. It can't have a speck in its eye. It can't have a knot on its head. It can't have a, an underbite. It can't have a tail that's too long. It's got to be examined and, and, and certified to be perfect enough to be offered to God Almighty. Well, uh, Jerusalem is packed with people. Every household needs a lamb. So now up, up in the, uh, on, the, on the east, where's my east? That's east, okay, from here. On the eastern side of Jerusalem, there is a wall that runs, well, it's the eastern wall. And you got the, the temples close to the eastern wall. And then a little bit further north from the temple, there is the, uh, the golden gate. The golden gate where it is prophesied that the Messiah will enter Jerusalem. And in a little bit further north of that wall, the eastern wall, is the sheep gate. Now the sheep gate is for this purpose. So that at Passover time, all these thousands and thousands and thousands of yearling lambs have been brought up from all around, from around a certain area close enough to Jerusalem, including uh, Bethlehem. Bethlehem down south. Bethlehem down south a few miles, okay, was a center for growing a lot of lambs down there. And so Jesus was born where? Yeah. In Bethlehem at the lambing place. And the shepherds, your Christmas shepherds, were priestly shepherds who found the babe wrapped in waddling clothes, which they used for lambs, laid in the manger, not just a manger, but laid in the manger where it had been, the lamb had been checked out, examined, certified, and said, this is a lamb without spot or blemish, placed it in that manger. They wrapped it up to protect it. And now it's going to become one of the lambs that's going to, within a year, make its way, be taken to Jerusalem to be sacrificed at the altar before God Almighty. So all these lambs from, from Bethlehem and from other places around within a certain length of, uh, of distance from Jerusalem are all up there by the sheep gate. Well, it's, it's lamb. It is lamb choosing day in Jerusalem. And so there's a man from every household going to be the representative. So they're going to, they're in Jerusalem. They're there for the holidays. Now they're going to go up to the northeast corner where the sheep gate is, and they're going to get their lamb for their household. And they don't have to worry about whether it's good enough because it's been, it's been certified by the priests. And here it is, and they, you know, they, they, they get their money exchanged and all that, and they, they get this lamb, and they pick it up, and they put it over their, their neck, and they take it back. It's the 10th of the month. And now they're going to take this lamb and take it back down to where they're staying, some are in town, some are camped out all over the place. A bunch of people are camping out on top of the, uh, uh, of the Mount of Olives around Gethsemane, which is where Jesus is going to be spending people, people everywhere, campfires everywhere, okay? And so uh, in the midst of all this, it's just a mass of people. It's lamb selecting day. And so you go up there. And you look at all these lambs, and the, the, the priest says, well, here's a good one for you. So there's your lamb. This is going to be your sacrifice. He's adorable, right? He's cute, and he's sweet, and he's fluffy, all right? Four days, he's going to be tasty. And they take this lamb, and they take it back home, and they're going to keep it up for four days. And they're going to have to do this again next year. Why? Because the blood of that lamb is not enough. The blood of that lamb is not going to forgive you of your sins. Well, then why did God say to do that? Year after year after year after year. Why did he tell them to do that? If it's not going to be sufficient. Because it's not about the blood of that particular lamb. What's God, what's God saying? What's he doing? You know, when John the Baptist, three years before this, John the Baptist down and dunking him down in the Jordan River. And he looks up and he sees his cousin Jesus walking up. And you know what he says? Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. So it's your lamb choosing day. And you need to choose a dandy, right? 
careful which lamb that you choose. Everybody's got to have a lamb. Every household's got to have a lamb. It is a requirement of God Almighty and his law. And an interesting thing happens. While the, people, while the men are down there gathering up their lambs, now for the household, that about that time, a new group of pilgrims are coming in. They're coming in from, uh, from the east. They're coming down the, the Mount of Olives, across the Kidron Valley, and they're going up to Jerusalem. You know, Jerusalem's a city on the hill. And no matter how, which way you come to Jerusalem, you've got to go up to Jerusalem. Okay? Now, in the book of Psalms, there are many of the psalms that are arranged for, uh, I think the old King James calls them songs of ascent. So, as you're making your way up to Jerusalem, there are places on the, on the trip where you would stop and rest or where you would be uh, cued to, to sing a particular song. There's a, there, there's a set of psalms in there, and that is their purpose. These were uh, ascending to Jerusalem on the day of, well, on your, on your pilgrimages. So it, it's people, they've walked a long ways and they're, they're making, to Jeru, making it to Jerusalem and they're maybe sending someone ahead to try to find the, the kinfolk where they can gather up. And everybody is happy and everybody's joyful and it's just a party and there's all kind of really good stuff going on. And one of the things that happens in Jerusalem is that groups of pilgrims who have already made it to Jerusalem, they'll go back down to one of the gates and they will greet other groups of pilgrims that are coming in. And they will sing part of Psalm 118. All right? So group one comes along. Here's a bunch of pilgrims coming in. These pilgrims are already in there. And group number one will sing Save Now. And the word for Save Now is Hosanna. They will sing Hosanna, which means Lord, save now. Hosanna, I pray, O Lord. And the group coming in would respond with the second half of the verse. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the first group would say, uh, we have blessed you from the house of the Lord. And the other group would reply. So, there's, so they've been used to singing Hosanna, Hosanna. All the time. It's part of their song. Part of their welcoming song. And so they would sing part of it, and those guys walking in would sing part of it, and then they'd all come together, and they'd go do whatever it is they needed to do. And this is just going on all the time this week, people getting into Jerusalem. But on Lamb Selection Day, here you are, you've got your lamb, and you're ready to go do what you need to do, keep it up for four days. And now there's a group of pilgrims coming in the Golden Gate, down the Mount of Olives, across Kidron Valley, and up to Jerusalem. They're entering in through the Golden Gate. And this time, it's not just a bunch of pilgrims, but one of these pilgrims is riding on a donkey. Riding on a donkey. Now, everybody there knows the, I mean, the, the Jews, they, they knew their Old Testament. And they especially knew anything that had to do with them being made free. They weren't under Egyptian bondage any longer, but they were under Roman bondage. Uh, occupation and they were under the iron fist of the Roman emperor and so they knew the Old Testament prophecies that, that uh, Zechariah had prophesied here's what's going to happen behold your king is going to come to you your king is going to come to you but he's not going to come riding a war horse or in a chariot he's not coming to conquer he's not coming with a sword he's, he's coming on a, on, a, on a young beast of burden He's coming as a servant. He's coming in peace. And so uh, he is going to ride into Jerusalem. Your king is coming. But this time he's riding in gentle and approachable to be a servant. Well, everybody knew about Jesus, right? By this time, because he's ministered for three years. And this is his last week on earth. And so Jesus has come up there and he said, he told his guys, he said, You'll go, go in there and you find this donkey and you find this colt. You bring him to me because I'm going to fulfill this prophecy today. Now, it's lamb selection day where everybody is supposed to pick a lamb. And at the same time, Jesus is right again. This is Palm Sunday. This is the, four, this is the, the, 14th, uh, the, the 10th day. This is, is the day when he's come, come right again. With, we call it the triumphal entry on Palm Sunday. 
And so they, the, the people see Jesus of Nazareth and they've heard him preach. That here's Lazarus right here with him. He used to be dead, not anymore, right? They've heard his words. They've eaten the bread and the, and the fish and they, they've followed him around. They've watched him cast out miracles and heal the sick, sight the blind. Every, Jesus is extremely popular with the common people at this moment. And everybody says, that's Jesus of Nazareth. And here he comes. What's he doing? What's he? Well, he's riding a donkey. Why is he riding a donkey? And everybody says, well, obvious, isn't it? Our king is coming. And he's coming in the, the golden gate. And he's riding in, but he's coming. He's fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah. So he's riding in meek and lowly and humble to serve, not to conquer. And so they took off their, they made their, they made the poor man's uh, red carpet, right? Took branches down and palm leaves and laid their coats down there to make a, a red carpet for their king, riding in gentle and humble. And, uh, and so everybody we get, were singing that song. What were they singing? Hosanna, Hosanna. And he ties some other scripture with it. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is, the, the, is our king. Blessed is the son of David. Lord Hosanna, save now. And so as Jesus rides in, and now you have a second choice to make. Not only do you pick a lamb, but now you also have to pick a king. Because, you know, remember, uh, uh, picking a lamb is going, to, uh, is going to take care of the negatives, take care of the sin, your, your, uh, the marks against you in God's ledger. But you need and you want, and God wants more for you than just for you to be uh, forgiven and make it to heaven by the skin of your teeth. He also wants you to become a child. He wants you to become a, a member of the noble royal family of heaven. He wants to, you to become a citizen of the kingdom of God. And so today on, the, on, on this 10th, on the 10th of their first month, they had two choices. Choose a lamb, to, someone to, something to forgive you of your sin. And choose a king because are you not sick of Caesar? And nobody has any respect for the Jewish puppet king. His name is Herod, one of the Herods. You need a new king. You need a new kingdom. Now, when Jesus rides in on the donkey, there's your king. When you're, when you're picking a, a lamb over there, up north of there a little bit, there's your lamb. There's your sacrifice. So when you look at this lamb selection day, Palm Sunday's happening at the same time, then you kind of get an idea that God's saying, listen, I am here. I'm doing big things and mighty things and glorious things for you. I am giving you the lamb of God, which will take away the sins of the world. And you don't have to slaughter animals any longer and sacrifice them on the altar and see if God will accept your animal sacrifice for the remission of your sins that is no longer needed because all that was just a type, a figure, a figure, a metaphor, an analogy. It wasn't the real thing. It was every drop of blood, every little fuzzy lamb, all pointing to the real lamb, the true lamb, the lamb of God, who is going to shed his blood in just a few days for the forgiveness of your sin, for my sins, for everybody's sins. He's the Lamb of God, and He will take away the sins of the world. Your sin debt can be paid. Choose the right Lamb. Now listen, people choose all kinds of lambs in this world. You say, preacher, I've never even owned a lamb. Well, remember, it's a metaphor. What are you counting on to get you out of hot water with God? What is it in your life that you think, oh, this, if, if, if I do this, God's going to say, you know what? You're good. People chase after everything in the world. Oh, I want to live a good life, or I want to be a good person. I want to be religious, or I'll, go, or I'll go to church, or I'll be sure I'm not as bad as some of those people that I could name down at that church. And that ought to be enough, right? I'm picking the wrong lambs. They are not without spot. They are not without blemish, Right? They're not fit to be offered to Jehovah God. What kind of lamb are you going to show up with on your judgment day? What kind of works? What kind of argument? See, there's a big fallacy. People think, well, when I, on my judgment day, I'm going to talk to God about this, this, this. No, 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 no. On your judgment day, judgment day is sentencing day, not argument day. 
court is in session now. And the verdict will be rendered at the moment of your death. Judgment day is sentencing day. Unless you're a Christian, judgment day is payday. Amen? Amen. Big, big difference. On your judgment day, what are you going to present to God? What's going to be your lamb? What are you going to take to God and say, well, I, I did this or I didn't do that and it ought to be good enough? When God says, I'm not looking for all that other stuff. I don't need no fuzzy lamb. I don't need your good works. I want you to do all these things because I have sent you the lamb of God, which will take away your sin. And I, no matter what else you might try to present to God in comparison to the perfection of the blood and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ it means absolutely nothing. And to take it an exponential step further, it means that you've looked at my son on the cross. You've counted his blood as being as being undesirable and unfit for you and you're going a different way and that is a slap in the face of holy God you can't say well I would rather not it doesn't work that way God says my son died for you what will you do with him well I've got trinkets and trifles don't care about that I've got good works done in my own steam for my own benefit don't care about that what did you do with Jesus You've chosen the wrong lamb, and it's going to cost you your eternal soul. But on the other hand, if you pick the right lamb, amen? amen? You pick the right lamb, you pick the lamb of God, you're going to take away the sins of the world. Now you walk up there to heaven, and do you, do you need to make an argument? Is St. Is, is Peter going to say, why should I let you in here? No. He's not going to ask me that, you know. Or I'll ask, I'll make it ask him, caught any fish lately? Right? Listen, when I get, to, when, when it's my turn to go, I'm going home. Amen? I'm going home. I'm not dragging all this junk with me. It's all been handled by the blood of the lamb. But there's another choice to make. Not just a choice for a lamb, but a choice for a king. Where does your citizenship lie? The kingdom of darkness or the kingdom of light? The kingdom of this world, whether it's, you know, represented by Egypt and Pharaoh, represented by Rome and, and, uh, and the emperor. This world system, is that your kingdom? Is that all you've got? You say, well, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a free. Nobody rules me. That's a lie. Humanity is a slave race. You don't get a choice whether or not you're going to be a slave. We're all born under sin, right? None of us are born infinite and sovereign, are we? And we fake ourselves out and lie to ourselves and tell ourselves how free we are. We don't, and we, people say, I don't have anything to do with God, don't even believe in him. Well, you're walking on his earth, you're eating his food, you're drinking his water, you're breathing his air. You have more to do with God than you can possibly imagine. The interesting thing is, even though you may not believe in God, God believes in you. Isn't that something? And so God says, I want more for you than just your uh, spiritual perfection, your freedom from sin. Adam and Eve were free from sin before they, before they ate that fruit. But it wasn't enough. It's not what God was after. God says, here's what I want for you. First of all, by the blood of the Lamb, I will wash away those sins and take care of all the negatives. But we're not going to leave you at zero, right? We're not going to leave you at just, at just a blank. I'm going to start adding things. I'm going, to, I'm going to have you born into my family. You're a child of God. Hmm? I'm going to put my Holy Spirit within you. I'm going to give you gifts and talents and opportunities and abilities. I'm going to give you all the promises of the Bible and make them uh, uh, applicable to you. I'm going to give you my promise to never leave you nor forsake you. I'm going to be with you every step of the way. I'm going to give you a, a, a good life with the Lord Jesus Christ and something good to do. And I'll give you, a, there'll be problems, but you'll be able to handle it by faith. And on some glorious day, I'll bring you home into my kingdom in heaven. 
And you'll find out that you're just getting started. Because the way up from zero is infinite for all eternity. That's what eternal life is all about. Now then you have to choose a king. You have to choose a king. You have no choice about whether or not you're going to be a citizen of a kingdom. But you do get to choose what kingdom you'll be a citizen of. Choose a king. Now on Lamb Selection Day, the pilgrims at Jerusalem said, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the son of David. This is our king. You're, our king is coming to us riding on a donkey. By the way, one of these days he's going to ride into Jerusalem again, won't he? Huh? He's going to land on the Mount of Olives. He's going to ride it. But will he be riding a donkey? No, he will not. What will he be riding? He'll be riding that war horse, right? And, and, the, and the sash of his robe says what? King of kings and Lord of lords. That's my king. But what about today? We're still in the land of metaphor and, and, and analogy and, and in parables. What does this mean to me? It means that in my spirit, I am a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. I have a king. I've chosen that, that king, the one on the donkey, that meek and mild, the, that lamb, the lamb of God. I have chosen him. And I need a king. And I love being a citizen of the kingdom of God. Amen? And I've said it many times, and I'll keep on saying it. I always much prefer my king over any of my elected officials. I don't care what official you're talking about. They'll never match up to my king. Amen? Amen. Now, a few days later, they're going to they're drag Jesus up to Pilate. And, uh, and he'll say to the crowds, what will I do with Jesus? And, and they'll say, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate says, shall I crucify your king? And the people will say, we have no king but Caesar. They chose the wrong king. Amen? And when he's on the cross of Calvary, they put his, they, they, they put his uh, charges above him in three different languages. What does it say? This is Jesus, king of the Jews. This is what we do to rebels. But you know the story. You know, you can kill him, but you can't keep him down. Amen? Now, Jesus, in arguing with Pilate, they said, he said, well, are you a king? That, that's the accusation. And Jesus said, my kingdom is what? Not of this world. Oh, you are a king. Yeah, he's a king. Weren't you watching him come into Jerusalem on the donkey the other day? Of course he's a king. But his kingdom is not of this world. So go ahead and render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Because he is your, your, your uh, physical legal authority here on his earth. He's your civil authority. So keep, keep their laws. Stay out of trouble. But at the same time, render to God the things that are God's. Because you're a member of the kingdom of God. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, save us now. Here our king has come. We choose that man as our king. He's going to rule over me. He's going to lead me in my life. And I too will start out as a little guy on a donkey following the Lord. Or walking along beside him waving my little palm tree in the air and saying, Hosanna and hallelujah and blessed be the name of the Lord. But on one of these days I'm going to go see my king literally in heaven. Now I'm a, king, I'm a member of the kingdom of God. Now I'll be a member of the kingdom of heaven up there when I get to heaven. And don't worry about the distinction there. Just know this. God says, listen, I've got you covered. All the bad stuff, all that sin. Here's, I'm giving you the lamb. Choose the right lamb. Choose Jesus. But not only that, I've, I'm giving you a king. I've given you opportunity. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to uh, bring you into my, into my citizenship. I'm going to make you a, a member of my nation and my tribe and my people and my family. And the work of my kingdom. Our family business is the kingdom of God. And I'm going to give you all the blessings that come with being a member of the kingdom of God. Amen? So all this is swirling around going on in the, within the walls of Jerusalem there that day. 
And it was lost on a lot of people, I'm sure. And it's lost on a lot of people today, isn't it? But what about you? Did you, find, did you get the point? Did you get the point? That God has taken a million different ways to tell you, listen, you need me for two things. Just for starters. Number one, you must have your sins forgiven because you will not be allowed in heaven. Guilty of any sin. Let me say that again. You will not be allowed in heaven if you are guilty of any sin. Heaven is a perfect place. Heaven is for perfect people. You say, well, preacher, what about me? I've sinned. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God, which does what? Takes away the sin. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So, as a child of God, when you, when you go up to heaven, where did all your sin go? Oh, my sin been paid for on the cross of Calvary. Amen? Amen? That's it. It's done. It's a done deal. But I also want to choose. God says, I'm going to give you this, this great opportunity. You can have a king. You can have a lord. You can have a ruler. You can have a master. You can have an authority in your spirit. It's going to take care of, you, care of you now and forever. And it doesn't matter who your civil authority is, whether it's the Pharaoh in Egypt or whether it's Nero in Rome or whether it's the, uh, the, the freedom of democracy here in the United States of America or no matter where you are. God says, I'm going to give you a higher authority over you. I'm going to take care of you whether anybody else does or not. Amen? Amen? That's what God does for us. What's the employment rate in the kingdom of God? I mean the unemployment rate. <laughs> it's zero. It's zero. We all work, we all work for this. Because his kingdom is our kingdom. Amen? His good is our good. It means our father. King of kings and lord of lords is our big brother Jesus. Choose wisely. Choose your lamb. Choose your king. You have no choice about whether or not you will make a choice. You must choose. Choose Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, again, we love you and we thank you so much for your blessings. Thank you for the Lamb of God and for the King of Kings. And thank you, Lord God, that you've allowed us to have both just by selecting the Lord Jesus Christ and saying yes to your miraculous offer that you would be our sacrifice our Savior, and our Lord, and our God, and everywhere in between. Lord, we are so grateful to belong to you. Thank you for your blessings and your kindness. We pray, Lord, uh, this day that all of us here will make the right decision. Choose the right sacrifice. and Choose the right authority and the Lordship in our life. Lord, help us be sure that we've all chosen the Lord Jesus Christ and then live up to our choice by following our dear King. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.